Welcome to the Parasite Podcast, a show about me and you. We are Venom. Cool. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Parasite Podcast. And today I have someone who I've known for probably like three years now. I think we met in my comment section on one of my videos. And then, you know, soon after I started watching your stuff, I got pulled in by your reviews and your kind of your point of view, as you say. Uh, but then also you started making your own original content, like documentaries, uploading poetry and all this great stuff. And so I, I started falling in love with the direction your channel went in. And so I wanted to have you here and I'm so glad you're taking the time. So thank you to Jaya who runs the Blacktastic Media YouTube channel. I'll put a link to all that down below. Make sure you follow his work. This guy is amazing. To Jaya, say hello to everybody. Hello everyone. Pleasure to be here. It's been like three years and we finally, you know, formally met talking today. So this is cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Like we, I, I realized, like same with Anthony the other day, I had him on and uh, I realized, man, these are people I've had text conversations with in YouTube comments for like three years now. Um, and like, and I, I associate you guys with thumbs up on your videos and comments in your comment section. So it is, it's nice to actually speak to you right. like all these years, man. Um, so you have, before we get started with the interview, I do want to just mention this up front so everyone knows. Um, one of the things that brought us together actually uh, to do this now too was you have a film coming out called Sarah, which comes out in October. Uh, would you like to give everyone a quick premise of that? And, uh, and I'll also put a link to the trailer down below if everybody wants to go check out the trailer. Yeah, Sarah, what it is, this is my third short film. And um, the premise of this film is a gothic, tragic love story. And what it is, years ago, captains of ships had side jobs. What they would do, they would help deport slaves from Africa and bring them over to the mainland. And this particular captain happened to fall in love with one of the slaves. And, you know, this is talking about jungle fever from way back in the day. It's a no-no. It's, it's taboo, forbidden. And they tried to hide as long as they could. But once they got to the mainland, they was discovered. So they took her. Now, slaves don't have names no more. Once they're bought, they lose their native name and they don't have any name. Well, for his love of her, he named him, her, excuse me, after his favorite item, which is his ship, Sarah. So to get to the mainland, they find them out, this forbidden love, and they take her from him and they hang her in public for all to see. And also they made the captain watch as they hung Sarah. And then later on, they bound him his arms, hands behind his back, take him to his own ship and make him walk the plank, fall to his watery death. So his ghost is in purgatory. And years later, this ship sits on the mainland, kind of like a tourist, you know, thing. They're trying to sell the ship, but they're having problems selling the ship for obvious reasons. Right. But uh, if, if you happen to be a female and you venture onto the, on the vessel, be careful when you start touching the items on the ship and everything you happen to summons and wake up the ghost. And any woman is on that ship for too long by themselves, not going to end well. And that's pretty much the premise of Sarah. That's awesome. So yeah, and I had uh, the pl the pleasure of watching this recently. You said out of nowhere, you kind of sent me a link and you're like, "Hey, would you mind checking it out?" So for those of you who want to know my review of it, it will go up in early October. I believe the movie comes out October 28th, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. Yes. Awesome. And so anyone out there, if you want to check out my review of it, it will be spoiler free and it'll go up probably the end of the first week of October. So keep an eye out for that just to, you know, have it out there to remind you closer to the movie coming out that you need right. to check it out. And the movie, will it just be on YouTube for people to watch? Yeah, just on YouTube. Yeah, on your channel, right? Awesome. Yes. Cool. Yeah, look at that. Everyone out there, you want to, I mean, I'm telling you, go check out his channel. We're going to get into why here with my questions. Um, and so this will be more formal interview than my other stuff, but I will try to keep it casual and try to keep it uh, loose, you know, so if you say something, oh, yeah. I might build off that too. But I did have some actual questions here because you are, a, you know, not just like a content maker like the rest of us who like do reviews and things like that, obviously do that too. But you also, like I said, make your own content. You post up actual art, you post up your poetry, short stories. You have these things called director's talk. You have all these really great things on your channel. Right. Um, so I want to talk about them through these questions. So first off, awesome. um, uh, let's see where I want to begin with your quote, which I found in your about me section. It says, if I offend you, then you don't understand me. But if I inspire you, then you'll learn to love me. So, so that way the viewers can understand you a little bit more. Uh, can you tell us where you were born, where you were raised, and how you ended up on YouTube, sir? Sure. Um, I was born and raised in Compton, California. 
And um, we're talking some rough times growing up in a rough neighborhood. So by the time I was six or seven, my parents moved away from Compton to Long Beach, mm-hmm. stayed there until about I was 13 or 14 and we moved to Sacramento, which I reside at now. Mm-hmm. And as far as YouTube, I became a member back in 2014, but I didn't do nothing with it. I was just going there to watch videos. And I love movies. I love cinema. I watch all these little small movie channels. People who, who talk like me about behind the scenes, the director, the segment talks, man, this is really cool. It was like an expansion of Siskel and Ebert. I found my, 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 my vibe out there. So I got the courage late December of 2017 to do my very first video. And it was about a documentary on my brother who recently got out of prison after serving 37 years. He was a member of the Crips from the 1970s and 80s. And I'm writing a book on his life and doing a documentary film. So what better platform than YouTube to pick off this venture? And that's how I got on YouTube, December of 2017. I've been here ever since, and I, I love it. It's fun. Awesome. Yeah, and I met you pretty early on because uh, I think you left a comment on my channel. And uh, and I uh, was like, uh, yeah, and I was like, oh, this is this guy is awesome. Like you, uh, It's funny because uh, there's like an etiquette that people like try to imprint on me when I started YouTube. And there were like mistakes or things I made that people didn't like. Uh, so I wouldn't call them mistakes. It's just, you know, you don't know sometimes. So I think the way we met is you wrote in and said, hey, I have something on my channel you should check out. And normally the the, the etiquette for some people is you, we can't do that because I did that to someone and they kind of gave me a tongue lashing. But then I was like, but why, why? I didn't like how I felt when that guy did it to me. So why why did I do it to this man? I said, let me go check out his stuff and, and see what, you know, what's going on over there. And honestly, your reviews, I really liked your, you know, your perspective on stuff. I, you you got a great voice by the way, too. Uh, but you, uh, but so, uh, but then you, when I started getting into your documentary stuff and the stuff about your brother and that really hooked me in. And I was like, you know what, this guy's right to go around and tell people to check out his channel. I'm like, this channel is awesome. And since then you've been just putting a lot of great content on there. So, um, I love the variety. I mean, that's the thing about your channel is I love so much. So over the next few questions, we're going to dissect that variety just a little bit. Um, starting with reviews, live streams, and collabs. So these are mostly things th- that pulled me into your channel originally, um, but and a lot of stuff that most of us here on YouTube do. So we'll start there and get into the, the more creative okay. stuff that you've been doing. Um, what do you enjoy about these types of content uh, styles that you do? And, uh, and did they help you grow to the content that you are also mm. making outside of that. Now, as far as reviews, I grew up watching Siskel and Ebert. Yeah. You know, and uh, either thumbs up, yeah. thumbs down. Right. Straightforward. And there's no and there's no middle ground. And um, I got on YouTube. People have like a grading system, one to ten, one to five. And for me, that's really hard to do because I don't consider myself a critic. I don't have a newspaper article every week. I don't go to screeners all the time. I don't consider myself a snob critic, you know? I'm like a dude who loves movies. I know a lot about movies. I took college courses, how to do film. So I know a lot about film. I want to keep it loose and casual. I'm like, well, look, this is just my point of view. You can listen to me, take my advice if you want. If not, hey, don't hate me for my opinions on movies. Right. And so that's why I said it's just my point of view. Because some people get really upset. Oh my God, he didn't like Star Wars. And I'm like, dude, (laughs) Calm down, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the internet and the YouTube sensation is really a tricky, small section in the world that people are really kind of strange. Right. You have it's a tight community, but at the same time, it needs to loosen up and get some gears going in there. And I try to bring a point of view, even from a a, a black director or a black producer. I see things that some people might not see and bring a whole different touch and etiquette to film watching and critiquing. And people forget, a film critic is to critique, not criticize. And this internet buzz, people can't wait to tear you down. That seems to be the new thing. And I never want to do that. Sometimes I've tore films apart, but I don't want to, but sometimes you might just have to. But every film, bad, good, mediocre, in between, you can find something good about it. You got to just look really hard and have some patience because people put together film to succeed, not to fail. 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and also I know firsthand how hard movies are to make. And also I know firsthand how hard comic books are to make, which is why I've never really categorized myself as a reviewer of stuff on my channel. I always right. say I'm, I'm a discusser. Like I'm like, I like discussing yeah. things because I might, I'm going to tell you things from, again, like you said, my point of view, things that I look at, but I, as someone who's been behind the camera or behind the page of the comic, I know how the sausage is made. So I'll bring that perspective too sometimes. There you go. Um, and so, uh, so again, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of that when people go, Oh, I like your reviews. You're a great critic. I'm like, I am not a critic. <laughs> I'm just a guy with an opinion. That's it. Um, there you go. but that's great. And, uh, and yeah, I know people do like, I, I've gotten people who they'll, you know, they'll downvote your videos and not tell you why, which I'm like, I love downvotes. I don't mind cause it's engagement, but when they don't tell mm -hmm. you why I'm like, well, how, how can I know your point of view if you don't share it with me? So I always exactly. tell people, if you thumbs me down, just tell me why. So I know why, you, you know, why we disagree. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we're, we're all here to grow. And like you said, you're not, you're not doing things to fail. You're, you're creating things to succeed. And same with exactly. all of us on YouTube. We're not here to be taken down, you know, um, for who we are and what we think we're here to, you know, not be lifted up, but lift ourselves up in some ways. Very true. Um, you, you also cover on your channel sometimes news, you have discussions and you post vlogs as well as you share your poetry as I mentioned earlier. What led you to stepping beyond movie or show reviews to explore more creative ways to express yourself? Well, one of the main things about being a YouTube creator, you have to have content. Yeah. And a lot of creators struggle. Besides movie reviews, some people don't bring nothing else to the table. And sometimes I have so much to offer because before I got on YouTube, I own my own publishing company. I write books. I write poetry. I'm like, what better platform to share some of the things I've done in the past that I currently still do just to add content? And then I realized how fast it took off. They go, man, you're a great poet. You're a great writer. I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, and, um, and I have, for a period of about eight years, I wrote enough material for about 16 books. Um, Numerous of screenwrites I wrote and things like that, but they're sitting around collecting dust. And uh, so some people might not ever buy my, my books. They might not ever do this or that, but this way they're exposed to other things that I can bring to the table. And my book sales went up because of this. Um, I've done collabs because of this. They say, hey, and you bring artistry to your reviews. I put a little music in the background, you know, because I'm a former DJ too. So music, movies, art, Poetry is all one universe. So I try to inject as much as I can and make it so comfortable that it's almost like hypnotic. You don't realize why you like something until it's over. So that's yeah. what I try to do. Nice. I love that. I like how you paint the, you're right though. Every piece of art is like its own planet in a solar system of the same universe, you know? So right. you got like the music planet and the movie planet and you know, all that stuff. And, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I think they do share a lot of, especially the people who make that stuff, make music, make movies. They all, a lot of times come from the same place. They either, exactly. you know, come from just endless amounts of creativity or they come from like some kind of pain or some kind of love or whatever it is. It, it, it's emotionally driven a lot of times, um, but it's also creatively driven and it's a perfect marriage of the two, I think. So, uh, so cool. yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, yeah. And like I said, I love your poetry too. Like I would listen to some of that and I'm like, man. And like I said, you just, your voice, I'm like, he's got a great voice, which, you know, I think that's you narrating at the beginning of Sarah at, at one point, right? The skull. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll get into that in my review. Everyone. I won't spoil the movie, but, uh, yeah, that's, it was good. Um, so earlier I said that reviews are what pulled me into your channel, but what got me to stay, like I said, was uh, your Compton documentaries and that series that you did on your brother, um, as well as some of the other documentaries that you made, like the Nipsey Hustle one that you made and the Slauson Avenue, um, uh, which I used to live near, actually. Uh, so in oh, what cool. ways has making documentaries helped shape you as a director and as a storyteller? Man, documentaries are my favorite piece of film work to film because it's live, it's action, they're true stories. Um, you don't need actors. You don't need all this drama. The drama is created within the people you interview or the people you film in their own habitat. And Compton, growing up, has such a rough and bad reputation outside of Compton. Like, oh, my God, Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, and people get shot. That's true. Right. But also, Compton produced some of the best people in the world. Right. Ava Dubinick, 
director mm -hmm. from Compton. Mm -hmm. uh, the Williams sisters, tennis players, champions, right. born and raised from Compton. One of the best groups of all time, War. Uh, yeah. Them brothers came from Compton. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know that. Compton has produced some incredible artists. One of my favorite rappers, Ice Cube, is from Compton. And yes, he had a mom and dad, and his mom was a nurse, his dad was a janitor. They, they was regular people. He was not a gangbanger. He, just, he can look at the city and, as a poet, talk about it in a gangster way. Right. And so my whole purpose was to do documentaries about Compton, showing the good things about Compton, the positive things about Compton. It's not always guns and people getting shot and getting killed in gangbanging. Compton has much more to offer. So... The whole thing with my brother and I talking about this series, we want to show the good things and the positive things about Compton. Yeah, I love that, and uh, and and that was one thing I noticed while watching it too. I was like, I was like, man, like you know, that's right down the street from me, and like he's he's talking about all this. I'm like, because when I lived in uh, I lived near Koreatown for a while in Los Angeles, okay. and I'm like, oh, I'm like not even 15, 20 minutes from from uh, Compton. Right. Uh, so I'm like, that's crazy, and then so that's when I first started watching your stuff was when I lived in that little studio in uh, in Koreatown. Um, and awesome. man, I, I think I've I've moved in the time I've known you. I think I've moved like four times. That's crazy. What? Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I was in that apartment for seven years, no AC, no complaints, loved it. It was really cheap. And then one day they decided to like add $400 to the rent. And oh. I was like, I was like, man, I can't stay here anymore. Um, and then I just been bouncing everywhere since then. So, uh, right. so yeah, so I, I pretty much like the last four houses or apartments that I've lived in, you've been there, your content's been there, Anthony's been there. So, uh, so yeah, you guys have, like you said, even though we haven't talked, you guys have been there as friends this whole time. Um, so, cool. <laughs> so you also, you share short stories as well as behind the scenes videos that you do on your channel. Yeah. Like I said, director's talks, uh, movies like Sarah, which we, you know, we'll talk about next here in a second, but these are all things that take a massive amount of work, most of which isn't even seen in the final products. Uh, besides an amazing work ethic, if you don't mind me complimenting you, uh, which you clearly have, uh, what is it that drives and inspires more creative content out of you than just doing the, you know, review the standard stuff? Well, man, I love film. And one of my things I love most about film, when DVDs got really popular, I love the behind the scenes footage. I love the de deleted scenes footage. And my favorite thing was director and actor commentary. They're telling you everything that went on with this movie making situation through the course of the film. I was like blown away. Some of my favorite directors gave some of the best commentary. And what's weird, Steven Spielberg has never did commentary in his whole life. So you'll never know what the man's thinking ever. <laughs> but some of my favorite movies, listen to the commentary, it made me appreciate the movie more. Even like a lot of people crap on the Fantastic Four movies by uh, Tim by Story? Tim. Yeah. Yeah. I like them. Yeah, I do too. You know, I like them. For one, you know, I'm proud of a black director doing a big comic book hero film. But if you listen to his commentary, one of the coolest guys you would ever listen to. And it make you appreciate him as a director. You know, people, you learn more. It's not just a film that you watch, but get behind the scenes. So I use my channel as like a movie studio. You get behind the scenes. You get some access to the actors or actresses and things like that. And also... Me as a director, I'm gonna tell you everything that you want to know. Well, how did you make? How did you do that shot? How, what kind of special effects did you use? I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. This knowledge means nothing if I don't share it. So that's why I'm open and have a really strong work ethic to bring you everything accessible that I can about what I do. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, if you ever want to check out um, a great movie with a two good two well, I would say they're two not so great movies but they have amazing commentary tracks. Uh, Batman and Robin with Joel Schumacher, the late, great oh, Joel wow. Schumacher. Yeah, okay. his, his commentary on that, he'll, he'll walk you through and be like, well, here's why I made the decision to do this in the movie, but here's what I know fans expected me to do making this movie. Oh, and he kind of, yeah, he kind of compares like what, what he could have done if he went darker and then what he wanted to do, which was make a, he wanted to make a tribute to the Adam West Batman show. Um, right. So then, uh, then also, um, uh, Showgirls, uh, that, oh, that movie, really? is, yeah, it's not a great movie, but it has oh, an amazing oh. commentary. I have to check that out. Yeah. That okay. he'll literally, he'll literally, the director of that movie, um, will talk you each scene. He'll go, okay, so here's why this scene sucks. And he's like, uh, the, the, 
He's like, the lighting here doesn't work, but we went with it. We tried to fix it in post. We couldn't. And he'll break down the scene for you and tell you what worked and what didn't. And I always thought oh, cool. those, those two movies were a great window into how making a big budget comic book movie with executives breathing down your neck was, and then making something like Showgirls where it's more independent. Um, yeah, it was yeah. just, it was neat hearing both perspectives. I learned a lot from those commentaries. Awesome. That was really awesome. Um, so speaking of movies and making movies, Sarah is your next feature, which releases October 28th, like I said. Um, but before we get into the story and the filmmaking process, um, I want to know kind of what was the inspiration uh, for you to get involved with this project? Was this something you came up with or a friend? Like, how did that all come together? True story. Uh, 2019, I visited Oregon for the very first time. Never been to the state of Oregon. I had some friends out there. We shared the exact same birthday, different years, but same birthday. Cool. And uh, we've been friends for a while. I said, well, you want to come out to Oregon? It's the next state over. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm going to go visit Oregon. And my friend, wow. She lives on a floating house, two That's story. Crazy. On a marina that her grandfather built and they own. I'm like, well, you kept it hidden. And then it's on an island that they own 22 acres of land on this island called Savi Island. Yeah. And then her best friend owns a pirate ship. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> My friends own a Mustang or a two-bedroom apartment. A right. pirate ship. You look right. out. You look out the sliding glass door from her floating house, and there's a gigantic pirate ship. So I went on there and took pictures. I, I'm filming. Her friend came over, gave me a grand tour. I'm like, "Is this ship haunted? Cause it looked like a haunted." She goes, "Well, I heard it was haunted when I bought the thing, but I never knew the story." I'm like, "Man, I just finished the Comforter." I'm like, this would be a great second film project for myself. I, I wasn't really thinking about how I can do it. As soon as I got back to California, I came up with the story of, I like to inject my black history into everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Now, there are no black actors at all in this film. doesn't matter. The story came from a person of color. That's why I talk about slavery. Mm -hmm. I talk about interracial relationships. And the name of the ship was called Sarah. So. Right. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. So I wrote this little small treatment in my head and I called her up. I said, hey, would your friend mind maybe in a year I come back and film a movie on her ship? She goes, oh, let me ask her. Yeah, she's cool with it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and she's such a down to earth, cool person. Some of her best friends are thespian. So she was, we was put together this crew from California and Oregon to do this project together. COVID had a lot to do with things not going the way I wanted it to go, mm -hmm. but I had a good backup plan. Well, Bree, the lady who owns the ship, is the star of the movie. The lady that owns the ship is the one in the film. Gotcha. I, said, would you mind? I said, would you mind being in the film? I asked my friend, would you mind being in the film too? She goes, sure. So I got my two friends who live in Oregon who own the ship, own a marina, and own the houseboat or the floating house to be in the film. Right. So it made it easy with dialogue because they knew each other. Right. And that's how Sarah got originated. That's the genesis of Sarah from that experience. That's awesome. I, you know, I try to tell people a lot on this channel. Like when I talk about, it's hard because I talk about Venom all the time. So that's a big budget movie with a lot of things already in place and a lot of people who already, you know, know what's going on right. and, and essentially in theory know what they're doing. Um, but, uh, but when it comes to indie stuff, like sometimes that is like, sometimes it's like, Hey, I met a person, they own this, they said I could use it. We, you know, uh, his, their wife or sister is an actress, so I put them in the movie. Yep. Like, that is a lot of times how indie films are made and people just don't understand that at all. Um, Absolutely. But that's amazing. I, yeah, my friends own Funko Pops, like, and you, you got <laughs> friends that own pirate ships. That's amazing, I would love to own a pirate ship, holy cow. Um, that is the, <laughs> it's so cool. Um, yeah, that blew my mind, I couldn't believe it. That's amazing. Well. Um, well, like I said, you were kind enough to let me watch the movie before its release, and, and you wanted to know my thoughts on it. Uh, one of the major positives for me, though, because I'll give you a little teaser. My review hasn't gone up yet. Like I said, folks, it'll go up in a couple weeks. But um, to give you a little teaser, one of the major positives I had for the movie was your eye and the way you capture scenery, and especially how characters move through that scenery. It seems like such a little thing sometimes uh, in movies, but it really does. Like structuring a scene is not easy and uh, and blocking off a scene, getting people to get from point A to point B in the scene, 
all that stuff I thought you really did. Even with like the dog, like finding the ship and everything, like you had a lot of great shots in the movie. So with that, like what was what was the key for you? Like what how did you want to capture this? And uh, and you know, and what was kind of your focus? Like, you know, was there any movie that you're like, oh, I'd like to shoot it a little bit like this, or this shot inspired oh. that? Was there anything like that in this movie? My two most influenced directors growing up is Steven Spielberg and Spike Lee. Now, Steven does things on a grand scale. Yes. I mean, he's the, he's the epitome. Like, okay, I wanted to create a shot where I'm filming somebody from behind, and as the camera rises, it opens up like Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that. And I got that in this film. Yeah. And Spike Lee uses a lot of stills, still pictures to tell a story, mm -hmm. and you don't understand it until it comes full circle. So in this film, in the beginning, you see a lot of fills, a lot of still photos. You're like, okay, a house and this. And later on, it comes back into the story because you see the house in real time and real person. So I used two of my favorite director's techniques to create my own story. And, um, you know, I love Dutch angles. So a lot of my films have Dutch angles. Nice. And your mind doesn't know this or your, you don't know this as a human being. When something's off or tilted, it's telling you something's wrong, but you don't understand it. You're still watching the film like, oh, that's peculiar. No, something is wrong and something's about to happen. It's called foreshadowing. Right. And Dutch angles are my favorite thing to do to make you feel like, wow, this is, this is not right. And your brain's trying to tell you it's not right, but you don't realize it. And man, playing with film, angles, and shots is masterful if you can do it right. And it's so fun. It tells a story within a story without saying anything verbally. Right, yeah, visual storytelling. I love when directors do that. Obviously, you named two of the best at it. I agree with you on Spike Lee. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, sorry, but <laughs> Stephen, and Steven Spielberg, yeah, Steven Spielberg, who, <laughs> and of course I blanked on his name. So my first production job in California ever, I worked for Steven Spielberg, my first job. Wow. Yeah, cool. um, I went out to California in 2007 and I knew no one. I was going out there for an internship and then I, when I got out there though, obviously the internship wasn't going to pay. So I needed to find a second job that would, I could work on my days off of the internship. And uh, a friend of mine who knew me here in Florida um, named Dan, I think he, uh, he said, Hey, I got offered a job. I can't do it. Would you like to take it? And I said, sure. And I went and worked on it and it was a Steven Spielberg produced show called on the lot, which mm -hmm. was about a bunch of uh, young filmmakers. So it was kind of like American idol, but each week they would bring a short film in. So they would have one week to film it and shoot it and everything and edit it. And then they'd bring it on the next Monday and they'd show it. And the audience got to vote on whether it, you know, uh, they oh. got yeah, it was a really cool show. It only lasted one season, unfortunately. But my second day on the job, I met Steven Spielberg. Uh, and it was the just, I was like, unreal. I couldn't believe it. We were installing, uh, wow. they were installing movie theater seats. They wanted the, the, the theater that people sat in to look like a movie theater. So they said, hey, does anyone here know how to drill in movie theater seats? And I was like, yeah, I've done that before. So they said, sure, come on over. So I went over, drilled the seats in. Um, I was a PA in, in I guess in here in Florida when you're a PA you can pretty much do anything there's no unions okay. there's no unions or anything but in California that's right. that's, there's there's a difference so they just assumed I was okay. an art PA and they just let me do it and uh, and then oh. at the end of the day my boss uh, the person I was supposed to check in with they were like you know like where is Seek like where, this guy we just hired him he's a friend of Dan's like why isn't he here he hasn't been here all day I guess he never showed up so just call him and tell him he's fired. So they call me and I'm downstairs drilling seats in and I go, they're like, hey, you're fired. I go, what? And <laughs> they're like, they're like, where you been all day? And I'm like, I'm here, I'm on the set. So every, this whole like group of people <laughs> came down and they were all like, dude, you're supposed to check in with it. And I'm like, I don't know how things go. Like, I, I didn't know that. Like, I just saw people needed help and I jumped right in. Like, that's just kind of how I oh, am. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. And, and they were like, you can't do that. There's unions or this and that. So, uh, so I guess like someone heard that. And so Steven was visiting the set to see what it looked like. And because I had helped them, we got like 90% of the theater done. So when he showed up, he was able to see a nearly finished product. And he nice. was so happy. And he said, this is amazing. You guys did a lot of work in just a short, you know, such a short time. And, and actually the, the art director guy said, well, it's because of this kid who just got fired. And they said, nah, he can stay. <laughs> and so I got to stay on that show, which was awesome. So oh, little, man, that is cool. Little That's fun. a great so I never story. told that story before on my channel. So there you go. Everybody. Oh, man, awesome. So I can vouch for Steven Spielberg. He's an amazing dude. <laughs> um, 
All right. So now it's stepping aside. <laughs> like with most okay. things, that, like with most things that I review, um, obviously I have, I, I guess critiques is maybe the, the wrong word sometimes. Right. Sometimes I have questions about stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, like an audio issue here or a lighting issue there or whatever, but I also understand how difficult it is to make movies and comics, so I try to keep that in mind when I discuss these things, um, especially with people that make these things. Uh, so no matter how harsh or constructive a critic can be, we are usually, you know, as people who make our own stuff as well, we're harder on ourselves than most people can be on us. All the time. So, so what did you run into while filming, Sarah, that you maybe were too harsh on yourself about, but then it became a teaching moment for you? Sarah was a difficult project from beginning to end because COVID had a big part. And I'm filming this movie in another state, so I had to wait till the weather was good. When the weather was good here to travel, the weather was bad. Or the main star of the film, she had pre-existing conditions. So COVID really jeopardized her life. She could have possibly died. So I had to make sure she was absolutely safe. Everybody wore a mask on the set. And then when things were ready to go, the weather, uh, the death of the family. It was weird. And the people that had had, had a, another character from the previous film I was bringing over, he had a death in his family. I had to rewrite the script. So many things happened. And this movie was in production hell for over a year. I filmed some stuff in California. Had to wait six months to go to Florida. I mean, excuse me, go to uh, Oregon. And as you know, films are filmed out of order. So right. any other film was shot like a half a year ago because <laughs> it was winter time that came back into the summertime to do this and that it was it was hell then on the set i'm in a different state things are different man uh there are bats at night on the marina what so i'm not filming nice things bats are flying past my head hitting me in the head bat <laughs> dude i'm a kid from compton i used to that country shit. i was scared as hell i was yeah. like damn and then we had, a, we had a day we had to clean up the boat. Sarah, we had a crew to clean up the boat. And our star was there. You know, she owns the boat. She goes, okay, the power wasn't working. So she went outside out onto the dock to check the power box. The cord was kind of loose. So she lifted it up and put her hand in there to check it. Hit a beehive. No. That was the size of a softball. Oh. She got stung like 17 times in the middle of me being there for the last week of filming the film. Oh. So, Luckily, a guy who was working on his boat next door was watching us film the movie, had some Benadryl, gave her some Benadryl. I learned a lot. I didn't know bees give off, um, uh, what do you call that, pheromones. Yeah. So she was walking to her car. She got stung again by another group of bees. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. So she was out for two days in the middle of filming her scenes. Wow. And this is like the last week I'm going to be. I'm like, but, you know, I did <laughs> exterior shots after exterior <laughs> <laughs> anything I did, I did a lot of editing a lot of sound editing right. and you can't panic when you're the director everybody's looking at you to make sure everything goes well i never showed uh anxiety in my face i said no work no matter what because i storyboard in my head and for every scene that i have i have a backup scene like i have like two versions of this film in my head so it worked out great but i'm telling you man every day was a task and and, and spiders in oregon are about this big they are huge. Jesus. And they, 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 they form webs overnight. You walk outside the front door one night, the next yeah. day in the morning you walk out, you walk into a web. Uh. And you got spiders coming down like arachnophobia. It's like, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, you know what? I wouldn't change a thing. It makes you think on the fly. Right. And you have to be impromptu. And you have to change the dialogue and do things because, you know, marinas are noisy. So sound right. design, you got to both come up. <laughs> and in the middle of a dialogue, say, hey, ladies, you ready? One, two, and action. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> so I embraced the problems. And you know what? It turned out better than I thought it was going to turn out because of all the issues and problems. And man, it's experience you can't teach. You have to go through it and you grow exponentially in, in experience. Yeah, I mean, literally no one, no one could foresee almost any of that stuff that you just said. And you're Ooh. right, that stuff happens, noise. Like, because everyone sees the final product. 
And I always hear like in reviews, like, you know, and sometimes I'll even do this, but I try to focus it on things that I know you might have control over. Even if I'm wrong, I'm like, I feel like they could add control over this, but with noise and stuff like that, sometimes people go, why didn't they do this? Or why didn't that happen? It's like, you don't know the limitations of things until you get there on the day. Sometimes you can plan as yep. much as you want. And this goes from everything from indie filmmaking to high budget filmmaking. You yep. will get to a place and like a, a venom too. They were, they had to like get a bunch of like, you know, people that were like homeless um, out of the alley. Like, you know, like they, so they had to like, you know, Hey, you know, go down here and you know, uh, you know, here's a voucher for some food or something like, you know, like they were like, we got to get you out of the alley cause we got to film in this alley. And then you have someone come in and spray the alley. You know, it's like, there's a lot of things that you're like, Oh, I guess, I guess, yeah, people who don't have homes would live in an alley and we didn't think to go look before, you know? Uh, so, <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, it doesn't matter and you can't plan for it. And so sometimes that no. does change your whole day, like you said, or your whole two days. But I like that, what you said. You, when you're a director, you can't panic or show the fear or show the anxiety because people look no. to you as the guide, as the leader. Um, and so you're like, okay, I, I will then use my time wisely and like you said, edit or I'll work on this or shoot exteriors. Very smart of you to do, man. Um, so it, clearly not your first film, obviously, but that's good to have that composure about yourself. That's really good. Yeah. Um, now, Sarah is about around 52 minutes or so, um, mm -hmm. give or take a few minutes. And it has a post credit scene, which I recommend everyone watch when you see the film, because I think that helped yeah. answer some of my questions. One major question I had, but it helped me answer a question while watching, you know, because at the end I was like, all right, here are like my four questions. And then that one, I was like, okay, I'm down to just three questions. Um, <laughs> but, but since we aren't talking about spoilers, I won't get into it. But I, um, I do want to ask, what do you hope audiences get out of Sarah after they watch your film? I hope people get used to, for the first time, hopefully in a long time, and hearing a cool, romantic story. Some of the best horror stories are in sequence with romance or love. Yeah. And I wanted to tell a love story, but I'm not a conventional guy. I want to tell an unconventional love story. Right. And I hope people get that feeling. And like, maybe what the lady went through in the film, like, I wouldn't do that. How do you know? If you're a helpless romantic, you might right. do what Stacy did in the film. Right. And also, I'm going to give people a history lesson um, about people's past. You never know who you're talking to, who you're dealing with, or their lineage. Right. And, and you know, you, you just never know. And there's history all around us. And if you don't ask questions, you will never learn. And sometimes you might learn when it's too late. So this movie is about chances, second chances. And be careful about history because um, there are people out there, entities out there that are unrest because of something tragic happened to them. And that happens and you develop anger and you develop rage. And that's something you can't compete with in a supernatural world when they're at rage and you're just a regular human being walking into their realm. That's true. And uh, I will say like, it's speaking on the note of like it being horror, but dealing with ghosts and spirits, but also a love story. like. It, it did kind of, um, in a way, it did at times watching it, made me think of the the second season of uh, Haunting of Hill House, which I think was called Bly Manor. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, because that one, I think even in it, they say this is not a conventional horror story because it's also a love story. And that's right. kind of the story you watch. it, And it is about the history, the history of the house and the people there and stuff. So, um, so when I was watching this, I was kind of like, you know, you were – making that at the same time as that show. So I, it was, it was just like a coincidence thing, but I was like, man, that's just one of those like great, um, like, uh, coincidences of like, you know, cause people always say like, Oh, this movie and this movie came out from two different studios. How did that happen? It's like, sometimes the ether speaks to multiple people at once and, right. and, and multiple people hear it at once. And so not, not that yours has a, a, a one-to-one -one ratio comparison to that show, but it just made me think of it at times, which I, if you watch it, it take it as a compliment because uh, Bly Manor, I, I didn't like it as much as season one of the show, but I did like it a lot. Um, right, so, uh, right. so yeah, it was really good. And, uh, and Sarah is, I mean, yeah, your hard work speaks for itself, but when people watch, I, I'll say, I was about to tell you what I thought of the movie, but I'll, I'll uh, wait till my review and stuff. But, uh, but I will say just overall, I loved it and I loved your passion, man. And, uh, and like I said, I may have questions awesome. about some of it, but it doesn't take away from the fact that now even more so I know how much work went into this and that's always what I try to keep in mind and what I tell people who come to my channel because we get a lot of young people that go, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do it? It's like, 
you have to understand film is not easy, which is why everyone doesn't do it. But for those out there who do do it, you have to understand there are obstacles and and some that all are the unforeseen time. all the time, like you said. So um, October 28th, you know, 2021, Sarah is out on your YouTube channel. Everyone, this guy's so close to 2,000 subscribers too. Let's get him over 2,000 subscribers. Anyone who's watching this, go subscribe to him and uh, and definitely be on yeah. Sarah. Um, you know, and just check out all of his amazing work. I honestly am, became more than just a friend. Like I, over time, I started becoming just a fan of yours. Um, I call Anthony on my uh, what uh, Anthony. I always call him the lighthouse because he's like this beacon that kind of brought me to uh, you in a way, and me to Mike Z and uh, Rashad and Q reviews. Like Anthony's so good at that, and it was so nice talking to him the other day about just life and like our channels and and growth and things. So everyone out there, just trust me. Anthony's a lighthouse for very talented people, and Anthony himself is a very talented guy. So yeah, subscribe to Black Catholic yeah. Media. Subscribe to Anthony. All their links down below. Watch the Sarah trailer down below. Let me know your thoughts, and yes. go go follow this man. Become a fan of his, too. Appreciate uh, it, man. Thank you. Hey, anytime, man. I appreciate your time, and uh, thank you again. Everyone, like I said, links down below. Any final words that you'd like to say before we head out? Hey, man. Uh, pursue your passion. Don't take no for an answer. Every person who made it to the top had people saying no, doors closing in their face. Determination is the key. Don't ever give up on your dream. I'm living proof on a small scale of what hard work takes. And you got to put in the work. And once you do, the rewards outweigh anything you can ever imagine in life. So always pursue and I shoot for the stars. Awesome. Good advice, everyone. Good free advice from a very talented man. So go check out his stuff and then uh, you know, come back here. We'll have more videos coming up for you very soon. Thanks so much for watching the show. Like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. We'll see you in the future. Peace. All right. Peace. <laughs>